And then you got your twiners. These are the bullwhip ones. Or um, I guess I'm starting to think more in terms of twist ties. These little tendrils that uh, grab on, I guess grapes do this too, to pull themselves up and attach themselves. And size matters. I remember I had a nice clematis at a customer's yard and it climbed up to the top of the fence post. And then I had a strip of bamboo that I used because it was a Japanese garden to connect it to the next post. It's actually a um, post of a deck. And I was disappointed that this clematis wouldn't climb along my tasteful bamboo. And then somebody told me that's because their hands are too small. Your clematis can't hold on to anything bigger than a pencil. So I just strung a piece of string underneath the bamboo and it grabbed onto that and uh, it's been spilling along the bambooing and looking great ever since. You should also know that the clingers sometimes need a flat enough wall. A friend of mine who takes care of a commercial property had trouble with her Boston Ivy not being able to hold on to a pillar. And it was a big pillar. It was about one to two feet in diameter, but it was too curved for her Boston Ivy to hold on. So it looked pretty silly. They kept trying to tie it on with string and stuff, and it never clinged well. It actually needs a very flat surface, and your twiners sometimes need a very narrow piece of pencil steel or some sort of a string or jute in which to grab hold and climb up. I tend not to use chicken wire because the spaces are too small and it's too hard to get it back off of that. Akebia is a good example of a twiner. And it looks like this. Isn't that lovely? Little tiny purple flowers, evergreen leaf. I had one just um, outside my window at home. I had worked for a lady who had a hell of a time getting rid of her akebia because it had rooted around her yard, had taken root around her yard, and she was bitterly complaining about it being so aggressive. And I thought she was kind of just a party pooper because who could hate something that looks this cute? And here's a picture of one that I saw. It looks almost like artwork. But a lot of these plants want to climb up to the top and then run around back and forth, building up on top of each other. And then you get what my friend calls the dead mattress underneath it. And that's not attractive, especially from the underside. All the flowers are up above where you can't see them. And you start getting those legs at the bottom, so you can't see it at the bottom either. Here's my akebia, and you can see it's starting to get those legs at the bottom. And you can sort of ameliorate that by periodically cutting some of the stems back to a foot off the ground and letting them regrow. I had sort of expected it to stay on uh, this little trellis and down where I could see it. But as you can see, instead I got some pretty ropey legs. And I realized now that it really is meant to climb on something. And it did, it climbed right on top of my roof. And it was beautiful, it looked like a, my house had bangs. And I loved it. But like I said, it made my husband kind of nervous. But with all those dead leaves falling off into the gutter every year, it seemed to work okay. But I gotta tell you, it's really aggressive. This is the akebia that is coming from behind my siding. And it actually ran down the side of my house and is coming up from behind my siding in several places, which is terrifying uh, if you are a homeowner. My husband cut it down to probably four feet off the ground one day and um, thought I'd be upset with him. And actually, I was really pleased because he just radically renovated it, and it just grew right back over the roof and up the tree and looked just great, got rid of the mattress, and didn't skip a beat. But we still had trouble with it coming up from behind the siding and doing some structural damage to the house. <laughs> so I finally had to cut it to the ground and paint the stump with concentrated Roundup, which is the 
uh, generic name is glyphosate. And I have written about that in my book, Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning, under the ivy section, because it is useful in getting rid of unwanted vines, some of which are doing some serious ecological damage in the woods. So um, just know that you can whack the heck out of a lot of the um, clingers and a lot of the twiners and just regrow them. Don't be afraid. Don't don't be afraid. You know, they're just, they're really going to be just fine. And then you have your clematis. There's an old poem, because it climbs on a lattice, the hoi polloi say clematis, but Webster will not cease to hiss until we call it clematis. And a lot of people will use either pronunciation. And finally, Webster has decided that both are okay. For a while, I was trying to train myself to say clematis. But now I guess just get to call it whatever I want. Uh, and this blue clematis is climbing up inside a white rose. A lot of times people will grow their clematis inside a tree or another shrub, and they will bloom together, and the effect is just spectacular. However, when you're growing a clematis inside of a rose bush, you kind of have to be a black belt in gardening to try and figure out how to prune this because, one, it's a wretched mess in the winter, and, two, it's thorny and hurts. And uh, four, you can't just leave it. you got to keep on top of it. And I guess five, you need to know what kind of clematis you have uh, and prune it accordingly if you want it to bloom the same time as your rose does. So clematis are extremely tough most of the time, well, at least with regards to pruning. And you're not going to kill your clematis by pruning it, by pruning it hard. I should mention that there is a disease called clematis wilt that gets them, and it looks just like they wilted, in fact. Uh, it gets in on a broken little bit of stem and will kill the plant from there up. So um, you are not spreading it with pruning because if you cut something off, there's no up for it to spread to. So uh, a lot of times people will prune their clematis and then, you know, three weeks later it dies. They think they, they didn't sterilize their tools or they did something wrong, and they really didn't. Uh, but it can be a heartbreak for clematis growers. What else should I say about clematis? They also defy careful pruning. If you've ever tried to, like, take out the weak wood, like they said, it's like trying to prune a skein of yarn, and every time you tug and pull on it, and you think you have a dead bit, it's attached to a live bit, and as you're pulling on it, you break a bunch of the live stuff, and it's really very nerve-wracking and kind of nightmarish, <laughs> which doesn't mean you shouldn't grow them. Sometimes people think I'm, again, vines, and I'm, I'm not. They really add that extra special ooh-ah garden effect to your landscape that is hard to get without a vine. And they really do wonderful things in the vertical mode. But uh, back to clematis. They divide them into three groups, but you shouldn't get too hung up on the three groups. You can prune group a like you prune group B and B like C and C like A, and you can fuss around with them and prune them any of these three ways, and they will be just fine. You won't kill your clematis by pruning it at the wrong time or the wrong way. The worst you will do is delay its bloom. So who cares? Maybe it was covering up the uh, old parked Volkswagen and you just wanted to be able to drive away, uh, and you don't really care what time it blooms. Just uh, go ahead and prune at will using the heading cut. There are three basic ways to take care of your clematis. One is just leave it alone, let it rampage, enjoy the flowers, and just kind of worry that it's smothering your plants. Two, you can strip it out, which is to say in the winter or in the early spring after it started to bud out, you can cut off all the side bits and just leave main stems and tie them back onto the trellis because when you stripped it out, you, you basically cut off all the little natural twist ties. 
And so you can strip it out, slap it back onto your trellis and tie it in and let it flush back out. And another way you can prune is just to whack the whole tangled mess back to two or three feet. And that won't kill it, usually. But there are three basic groups of clematis, and we're going to go over those. But like I said, remember, you can prune any group any way you want and change it up and uh, go out and try to have fun with your clematis. That's kind of a joke in and of itself. Pruning group A is the early flowering clematis, and they tend to have, you know, relatively smaller flowers than some of the other ones. But a lot of times the plant is extremely uh, aggressive and large. And examples would be uh, the evergreen clematis, clematis armandii, and another one would be Montana, which is shown in the lower picture here. And these don't look so wretched in the winter as the other ones do. The other ones look like they're something that somebody pulled out of the pea trap. It's just really horrible looking. Uh, but these aren't, aren't so bad. And you can just let them grow if they've got lots of space and pile on top of each other. And then when it gets too horrible, 5, 10, or 15 years later, you just whack it to the ground and regrow it. This is my uh, Montana, which is spilling out through a shrub called a tower court rhododendron that's blue. And I got to tell you, I have enjoyed my Montana, even though it's kind of scary. When I moved into my house, I had this chain link fence. And it was very bare. There was nothing in my yard. So I planted a bunch of shrubs and trees and then put a Montana on my chain link fence. And it rambled around on top of the fence and spilled down and looked beautiful and hid that ugly fence. Many years later, the shrubs grew up, and I can remember looking out my window through some lace curtains, and I saw the pink Montana blooming inside my purple lilac. It was so beautiful with those lace curtains. It just <sighs> made me sigh. Uh, but I was a little bit worried about uh, that Montana living in there year after year, kind of tangling up my lilac and maybe smothering it. So at some point, I just cut it out of the lilac, and then it ran down to the rhododendron, kept on going, got to the rhododendron, snuck inside, came piling out the same time the rhododendron bloomed with dark pink, the Montana bloomed with light pink, and it's just charming. You know, people walk by my house and go, oh, isn't that lovely? But I know it's lovely but a little scary because the Montana isn't going to stop until it's completely smothered my rhododendron. So I let it do that for a few years, and then I got inside and did my best to cut it off. Sometimes it doesn't matter if there's some old tangled clematis inside your evergreen shrub because people can't see it. You know, the shrub grows taller than the clematis tangle. But you can also, uh, in the spring, just kind of clip all that stuff out and uh, even let it grow back through your shrub the next year. And don't worry, you won't hurt it. And this is a, uh, the evergreen clematis, or mondii. And notice it's quite a beautiful shower of green. But also notice it's people can't get through the gate anymore. And you should know that, especially after a couple of hard frosts, you can get the mattress of dead brown leaves inside that you can't get out, even though you shake it, and uh, which I do, to try and shake as many as much of that dead leafage out of there as you can. Occasionally, it just builds up on itself and is too horrible, in which case you just take out your loppers and you cut it two to four feet off the ground and wait for it to regrow its fresh, beautiful new self. But the annual maintenance is let it grow. Don't bother. In summary, don't prune it for many years. When it gets too horrible, cut it to a couple feet off the ground. And uh, it's best if you do it after it's through blooming, and then it will bloom next year. If you prune it and do this hard pruning with the heading cut before it blooms, it won't. <laughs> it's that simple. So if your heart is not broken because it's skipping a bloom cycle, do it when you feel like it. Just know that when you cut something way, way back, it can be pretty scary. You don't want to do it when it's too young. It seems like clematis when they're little teeny babies, which is their first few years up to about five years old, they just die from the slightest 
you know, footstep of a dog. You got a dead clematis. So I, I tend not to monkey with them when they're too young. And if you wait till they're really too old and those ropes are really big, uh, the chances of it surviving is not as good. And what do I mean by really big? I wonder what the biggest clematis stem I've ever seen. An inch, maybe two inches. So uh, for best results, as I say, uh, don't prune it when it's too young or too old, but just right. This is what it looks like. A child could do it. Group B, or sometimes it is referred to as group two, are the early large flowered clematis. And they have enormous flowers. They overlap with the A's. By the time the A's are finished blooming in April, the B's have started, and they bloom April to June. Some of them are repeat bloomers. And these are the ones that are really nerve-wracking. <laughs> and you have to be a pretty dedicated gardener to uh, keep up on these. You want to um, strip them out by very delicately cutting off all the I guess we can call them twist ties, all the little tendrils and all the side stuff, and then tying uh, multiple stems back to the trellis. Uh, and just know that this vine is real prone to clematis wilt. Maybe you're messing around in there and you um, break a stem. That's how the clematis wilt can get in. So the problem with the bees is you have to leave them up all winter. You wait until uh, spring when they're just starting to bud out to strip them out. And it's very time-consuming and can be nerve-wracking. Uh, and it's very fine, difficult pruning. And they get the wilt. So if you're not up for it, stick to A's or C's. And if you become a dedicated gardener and a clematis aficionado, you might work your way up to the bees. Here is an example of a bee that's just starting to bloom. And uh, notice that this is one right before pruning. You should know that the bees don't get, they're not aggressive. They're not these, like these massive plants like the Montana. They're only going to get to be, most of them, oh, you know, four to eight feet tall, and then they're kind of going to stop. So you don't have to whack them back to keep them down low. They're pretty much going to stay down low anyway. But they hang on to these horrible leaves all winter long, so you have to put up with that. And then when it starts to leaf out like it's doing now, you go in with a hand pruner that is almost as small and fine as a scissors and clip off all the tendrils and side branches, at which point it's no longer holding on to your trellising. And you have to tie in what's left until those new tendrils come out and grab hold of it. And this is what it looks like when it's done. So um, this is the final product, and it looks all cleaned up and nice. So take your time. Once again, before pruning and after pruning, cutting off all the little tendrils and side bits of your little skinny stem. That's the bees. And then... You have your group C, and these are the ones that um, bloom in the fall, and a lot of people are pretty familiar with these. They look like some crazy lady's big flowered hat, and they bloom in the summer and in the fall. So late June to late fall, there's a whole bunch of different ones, great big um, flowers, and they get pruned at least around here in the Pacific Northwest late fall, just as soon as all the leaves turn brown and it starts looking like heck. Uh, back on the East Coast, people wait till the danger of the hard freeze is passed, and then they cut them back then. But they don't mix as big a mess back there. Around here, we just don't want to look at all that deadish foliage all winter, and we also don't want them blooming down the block. We want them down low, and so that's why we give it this hard pruning, and we don't want it to build up on itself and make the vine mattress of dead leaves and dead branches either. Keeps them crisp 
and clean looking. So for the C's annual maintenance, you whack it way back at the end of the year. It's actually pretty simple. Don't worry, it will work just fine. Here's a C blooming its head off. Isn't that charming? This is what it looks like as it reaches winter after the first frost. All these leaves hang on and it looks pretty cruddy. You don't have to put up with that. You just grab it, and my friend calls it ponytail pruning. Just grab it like you're grabbing a ponytail and cut it off. And then what's left, you um, tie back onto whatever it was climbing on so that it can get a leg up. So do you remember the three different clematis? Do you remember the three different ways to prune them? You can whack it back, you can leave it alone, or you can very carefully strip it out and retie it to its trellising. <laughs>